11 years and he's been very active in IT for IT. So now we're going to hear about applying IT for IT to smart cities. So this will be a, a good topic. Off Thank you, you Chris. Thank you. So I've seen some of you already before and I think I've met some of you during the lunchtime. My name is Eric van Boesbach. As you can hear, I'm from the Netherlands for giving my funny accent. Uh, I've been with HP for, like say Chris said, for 11 years and I'm part of the uh, Worldwide Strategy Department and one of the global CTOs in that team. And my focus is really on IT for IT. And today um, I'm trying to basically to build a bridge between the wonderful world of Internet of Things and the world of IT for IT, because in my view, um, those two parts basically are seamless, especially when we're going digital in the way that we work and we operate ourselves. Uh, I would find it harder and harder to distinguish between what is IT and what is basically then living a digital lifestyle. Because I think more than ever, I'm just trying to grab it, I have to put it on the flight mode, is of course, we live by this device. And if this thing doesn't work when you're on the road, it's actually very hard. So let's get going and basically let's start zooming in to this wonderful world of digital economy and digitization. And the more close we get, the more we zoom in, we actually have in the end us people on the road moving from A to B. And essentially, if you really make it very, very small, the only thing we do is to turn insight into action. Whether it's uh, what's for dinner tonight, whether it's, you know, what do we need to go for shopping, you know, where do we plan our next holiday, how well is my stock account doing, when is my next appointment, um, etc. It's all also about, you know, turning insight into action. But if you start extending that into a smart city, you know, you could start asking a question, where's my car, where's the next charging point, where's the next parking lot, etc. So insights into action, I would nearly say, is sort of the essence of what we're up about. And I would nearly argue that, what is digitization doing? I read a quote of someone who said that digitization is, ha is basically bringing to us the brain to what basically steam power did to our muscles. It's really helping us to become smarter and to make smarter decisions. We have more data to process and to basically have more insight to take, basically make most effective time of, make the most effective use of our time. And we became a little bit spoiled. Because we actually feel like now that things, when the things don't work, we get impatient. And you've heard of me say before is that you know, when things don't work, you just, with a flip of a finger, just delete the application and you find yourself a next one. It just has to work, always. And if things don't give me the right set of information, I will just find something else that does. And the nice thing is about it, the control is in my hands because I can decide what applications I'm running on my platform, the phone. And thereby, I see I'm selecting which vendors are supporting me. And the funny thing is as well, that we don't even think realizing it anymore, but how often do we actually speak with vendors, people on the other side of the phone? No, we select an application from a catalog. And that represents a company behind that, but it's being shown through the application on the phone. So the, company, the quality of that application needs to be up to par, otherwise we will find something else. And effectively, on the other side, we either select a vendor or we deselect a vendor. But if you're from the vendor side, you just gained yourself a customer or you lost one. I'm making it very personal as a human, but obviously this goes further than that. And Harry has basically, um, I'm, I'm leveraged with pride in an open form you, you use and you use slides wherever you can, so thank you for sharing your deck. Um, a lot of use cases, and we have spent so much time elaborating upon those use cases this morning, I don't, uh, don't have to redo that. But I think what it's showing is that there are many vendors involved in this picture, if you really take a vendor lens on this. And having more open standards will hopefully help us to avoid all those bridging activities, the connector building that we have done for ages, I think, across the whole industry in every domain integration buses, message buses, etc. Building connectors, I think, has been going some people's lifeblood. And, you know, we, got, we found ourselves a new territory to play in, from camera vendors to etc. etc. So, having open standards to, to make things connect makes sense. And in the meantime, making sure that things are talking to each other is very important. Otherwise, how can we actually fulfill those different use cases? And that's basically what's happening around it. Because we, 
again, me as a person wants to have a more productive life, a more fun life, you may argue, we are basically pulling and doing a lot of push on our vendors to actually pull data together. And that's basically where we have to have cloud environments where we feel like the data is unlimited. And if you just think about it, I had a brief lunchtime conversation with Don, who made some calculations on people in the police force, a small police force wearing body cams, going out there with uh, small 720p cameras, uh, running day, day in, day out. Those, even a small police force, starts generating quite a significant amount of data, and that's just a small police force of six people. Imagine what happens if you basically start pulling cameras around the whole city, etc. So the data volume is like uh, unimaginable. And then another thing is happening, and I think Harry showed this morning also the, the Tesla car versus the Toyota. Well, I love to have the Tesla car, to be honest. I don't like to have the Toyota Hiace anymore. But, it, but what is so nice about the, the Tesla is, of course, that because of your subscription, you get sort of seamless updates. It's a software-enhanced product. It gets updates, sometimes even while you're driving. Um, and the car is actually also ordering itself spare parts, or it actually let, let the company know that something is wrong and should be fixed while it's driving. Software either is the product or starts differentiating the product very heavily. And the moment it's being commoditized, we can make it hardware again. But that's an ever-continuing cycle. So this won't go away. It will only get worse. And I think I've said it before as well this morning, is that about, you know, my data should be about me. And the GDPR, Global Data Protection Regulation, for EU citizens is really coming about and helping basically to get some control back into our hands with severe, very severe penalties for companies that are managing and handling personal identifiable information in their data. Regardless of whether they're multinational, if there is data about European citizens in their databases, it has a big impact, up to 4% of their annual revenue of the Opera Corporation. I pulled some numbers, and unfortunately the graphic doesn't quite show it, but if you look very closely, you can see that in 15 years, this is data from the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, which you might well know is one of the big internet exchanges uh, in Europe, that in 15 years there was a thousand-fold increase of data traffic. Well, that's a big number, and we know data is exploding, and network traffic is exploding, and that's why we want to have 5G, etc. But imagine the impact of something similar happening to us, for instance, the cost of goods produced, the reduction of that, or the number of devices out there. These numbers are staggering, so we have to figure out a way how to deal with that. So like I said, if you boil it all down to the essence, what we do day in, day out, every minute, even people in the audience at this point in time, they're turning insights, data, processing, interactions on the laptops, computers, whatever. The same thing happens for all corporations, using systems, enterprise systems, to give them more data to process and to help groups of people turn insights, interactions. But at the same time, having people with other intentions trying to go after the same information because it's actually quite profitable to process the data itself. And then let's not forget that nowadays, and I used the example before this morning, is that my laundry machine, my washing machine, can actually start ordering itself the detergent when it's running on empty. Or cars actually starting to call out for spare parts when things are breaking down. And I think by next year, every normal car will have a, 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 a chip in there that basically starts calling in Global Connect. Then when an accident has happened, it basically will tell the, the exact uh, GPS locations. I know that some of the higher end models have that already for quite some time, but it becomes more and more commonplace that systems just talk to systems. They invoke an API. So what is important when we talk about the consumer, I started by saying, well, I'm the consumer. I, as a human, am consumer. But those systems around it, they also feel like they are, to an extent, consumers of information. They are consumers of services. So we're really building out a network of machines, systems, and humans, all basically going after the catalog. And I think for people that are well versed in IT for IT, I know that I know that you know where I'm going with this one. But they will let you. The rest of the team, there's a little bit more patience involved. So we really are creating a system of systems. And unfortunately, until the world has basically embraced ODF and ODI, we still have to figure out how to connect all these desperate systems into one. Because if we want to make a smart city work, or a smart office work, or a smart house work, we're really dealing with an interoperability challenge. But that's not the only thing. 
Because one of the interesting things as well is, like I said, is the data protection part. And I mentioned that the fines are really heavily. 4% of parent company annual budget up to 20 million. And another part of it is that's, that's quote unquote, just the money, which is significant. But for some companies, it's even more important that the brand identity, the brand reputation, it's much harder to repair. And if the data was not encrypted, within 27, uh, 72 hours after the event was detected, you actually have to go public with it, and because to, pay, to protect people's interests. So this is heavy. It's a real significant change in how we deal with basically all this data in a world that's getting more data flowing about. And after the session, after the break, we got more focus on that. And tomorrow there's another session wholly focused on, on that whole topic that it's one thing to tinker around and hooking up systems. It's another thing to make sure that personal identifiable information is hard to protect. And think about it, the cameras in the street, on the one hand they can help you protect. To an extent, there are law enforcement agencies that basically use that information to identify whether I'm, I'm, I'm good or bad. So we can actually help protect the other citizens around me uh, to actually have a safe day. But that's personal identifiable information. So it, it's, it's not trivial to deal with this because the cameras are rolling. And how do you obscure that data? How do you protect that information? It's, it's real, real massive. This, this is a hard thing to do. In the Nordics, there is an, in, uh, a conceptual paper being created, created about my data, and basically describes that I, and, and you, and you, and everybody individual in the group here, should have control over your information. Interesting idea. Because think about how many companies are making their money by knowing more about me than I know about myself, and profiling me, and profiling people like me. So, it's a real paradigm shift if you think about it, you know, how we, how we can gain back control. But it's a good thing uh, to think about. And it's becoming more severe. There's a movement about this. Blockchain technologies are technically making it able to do this. But how many implementations of that technology do we have? And I know there are some, but they're not mainstream. But it's happening. So we're actually gaining back more control about who it is that what we, who we are and my information, and I decide who will share a part of my information. And that's just the start of it. When I conduct a transaction, how often do you have to basically submit a lot of your own information, where you live, uh, but also things about cell phone numbers, etc. all kinds of information where you feel like, like, really? Do they have to know all the data about me? Well, they would love to have that data because they can help you profile, but it's not necessarily necessary to do it. So blockchain technologies, actually can also help you obscure that. I just give a trust relationship to you to conduct a transaction. That's the only thing I'd like you to know. And more of that, well, you, you, we have to decide how we're going to be compensated for that, or I decide not to give you that information. So there is a real change happening in the industry where blockchain is a real powerful technology, which is far further than Bitcoin, as I'm sure you all know. Data privacy by design. I think this morning we also said, and Kerry, you mentioned it, that there's a lot of data being generated that is not, this, that doesn't have any metadata. So it just sits there. It's very hard to understand what it's about. What would it be like if all those cameras would basically start sending meta information around it as well? All these sensors. So we don't have to figure it out after the fact. It just comes by design. Same thing with data protection and data privacy. In every step along the way, in the way we produce applications, in the way we think about what service you're going to offer, this should just be baked in. It's not an afterthought. It's the way we design. It's the way we budget. It's the way we build. It's the way we deploy. It's the way we operate. It's just a part of how we operate at all. And again, this is not just about human applications. It's about also systems talking to each other. And then you've got the network traffic, protected and unprotected. When we talk about the consumer, it therefore is not just a human consumer. It is also the system or the autonomous machine. And the things that really matter is basically the latency. And I guess that depending on what your background is, you think about it as, OK, it's network latency. If you're more from a network orientation, say, OK, how long does it take the data to move from A to B? Um, but you can also think about it like, you know, how long does it take a product to come to market? if you're more in a sort of a service development or product development role. And both are correct. How quickly can get that what I want to be delivered to where I need it? 
And when it comes to sort of big cities and smart cities, this becomes really, really intriguing. Again, that in the, the way that I prepped for this, I had some conversations about what, giving some use cases. And there are cities in the world that would like to basically have near real-time data between a car running the red light, license plate recognition, and then basically having all the events around that traffic light also being correlated so that the police can decide whether that was just an, accident, an, an incidental happening, someone that run a red light, or whether maybe a bank was robbed in the near vicinity so they can see the pattern. There was something like a 10 minute delay before that could happen. Now they wanted to have it in, I think, less than a minute. They would like to have that information there. So this is taking raw camera data, getting it back to the central, processing it, recognizing it, correlating it with license vehicle license information, sending it back to the people that want to consume it in the police department. That's also what latency is about. And the more we're going to get about this, the more we're going to find out cases where real time is really important. Think about kids using um, uh, uh, iPhones or uh, phones on when they're cycling or walking and they're trying to cross a railroad and the train is uh, appe um, uh, uh, appearing in the distance and the, the crossroads start closing but the kid doesn't see it basically. Now what would it be like? There's automated train control. There are typically cameras around the crossing as well. They can see the kid on the camera. They're so what would it be like if the camera detected, they see an accident to happen, they basically start shutting down the train in the distance or at least the, uh, firing the horn, etc. Again, latency becomes a real, real important issue there. And there are many other use cases where the ability to process information in real time and to turn insight into real significant action is critical. Interoperability thereby is key. No way of escaping that all these different systems from all the different vendors that let's face it, at first do not have an interest to be commoditized, to have the open interfaces, to be working together and to be able to exchange that information, to be able to process it, et cetera. So interoperability is a key thing. And as part of interoperability, the inbuilt security. Even though I would like to get myself protected when I'm basically not paying attention and crossing a railroad, I don't like my face to be appearing on Facebook or whatever else uh, because my information was not carefully protected. So it's in, and all this, I don't want to really pay for it. Not as a private person trying to cross a railroad, but also as a citizen of a city. I know that this doesn't come for free, but I don't want to sort of be doubling the, the city tax because I will move out. So it's an interesting sort of conundrum that we're in. We would like to be digitally enhanced, digitally augmented. We would like to be safe, have the right to leave my home and get back home safely, have a fun day. In the case of Dubai, have you know the most happy city in the world, or in other cities, basically to be the most data-driven city in the world. There are many mantras of visions and mission statements being done there. That basically say, okay, we're going to play with this. But in the end, you know, we as citizens are paying for this stuff. So we know that it needs to be invested, but we don't want to pay the premium price. Yet we still start exceeding the expectations. It's an interesting one. Especially for people who like technology. When I ask my son, okay, what does he want? He doesn't want to talk to dad when he wants to get on the Wi Fi on a network or wants to always play with his cell phone, right? He wants to do it himself. And he basically says, you know, I prefer self service, but I can't anything that seems relevant. So now he's to go to dad, and dad doesn't have time. So why is it taking the help desk so much time to basically resolve his problem? And he was also figuring out that, well, now why does the wife I work at my friend's house, why can't you get it fixed at your place, Dad? This can't be a, your unique problem. Why did you fix it before? Where's your problem management? I, and I got a new idea. I would like to have a new toy or a new tablet or whatever. You know, it wouldn't be worth investing in. Or why are they so slow to just fulfill my needs? You know, I'm, I'm sort of running behind. I got an old cell phone on, on the schoolyard. Not a good thing if you're a, a sort of a, a happy kid. But the same thing is for, for robots and machines, right? They have the same thing. If they can't get what they need, they, they become very disappointed. And this turns out to basically not, I'm, I'm sort of, we make a joke out of this as well, um, because this is a very serious conference with serious people. And it should be. But let's face it, you know, I, I don't want to have a disappointed robot or a disappointed car. Because when my disappointed battery driven car can't find himself either a parking space or a battery charging point, I will feel miserable shortly after. 
So the machines asking for those APIs or services are the same thing as humans, but that requires more standardization again to happen. So it's all about accelerating outcomes. And we asking for better, faster, cheaper, safer in modern marketing slang. Whether it's in budget overruns, I don't want to invest in things that don't matter to me. I only want to invest in things that really are critical to my business. I would like to improve the velocity of application releases because I know that if I get the application out there, I have a higher chance of serving my customer needs. And when something fails, I can start repairing it quickly because I know that's one of the key points that I'm still having customer retention with. Customer satisfaction, customer experience. I need to get stuff out there. I want to tinker, I want to play, I want to be able to fail fast and improve. I would like to make sure that people don't waste their time waiting on the phone. Like my son who's complaining that I still haven't given him a new SIM card for his cell phone. Or the availability improvements that, you know, when things are out, the Wi-Fi is down, then my wife doesn't call me here and tries basically to get the repairman in action. It should just work, always. And they deliberately make it small again, because the small things you have at your own house basically just multiply when you do it in a big city. It's the same paradigm. There are just more parties involved. It's a system of systems. And of course, I'm not telling you anything new. And so do the analysts know that corporations are saying, well, the business value chain, and let's say the IT value chain, well, try to tell me the difference between the two of them. It's sort of the two sides of the same equation, especially when you've got so much software involved in all the products that are being created. So CEOs, not CIOs, CEOs, are saying that their industry will be digitally transformed by 2020. If you look at the analyst reports, there is no country in the world, give and take, and no industry that is escaping from digitization. We live in a world where we'd like to have the access right, the right to access things, more than in a world that to own things. It's all about getting the subscription to things more than anything else. And that's also funny, the younger you are, the more you use that whole paradigm. The older you are, the more you like to hold things. You know, this, this is my car, my asset, my phone. Most younger people don't care as long as it works, looks good, and get a new one in time, I'm good to go. From a world that owns assets towards a world that subscribes to assets. 46 of product value will be digital in, four in, in 2020. But also there is an expectation of 30% reduction in cost for business operations driven by smart machines. And because of that, what's also interesting is you look basically the global trends of sourcing. We had a whole wave of manufacturing moving towards basically the east because essentially the wages were there lower. If you now look at trends, basically things are moving back west again because locally sourced, less la latency essentially, and also being able to actually be much closer to the customer needs in time. So it's not mass production, it's mass customization that's happening. And that is only possible because the machines become smarter, low production costs. So there's a whole movement happening. And if you watch one of the TED Talks, people are now saying, right, are we still training our kids the right kind of quality deg college degrees? Because we need engineers again, which we thought like we didn't have to have anymore in the past. And 84 of CEOs expect digital to increase the profit margin. So there are a lot of people that don't do this, they have a problem. It sounds so simple. And you have people and machines collaborating along a chain of events. Build a product, whether it's wholly software or partially software. You just take a demand, you build yourself a plan, you develop something when it's chartered, you test it, you release it, deploy it, operate it, then you have your customer experience. A typical software development life cycle, product life cycle, what, what have you. But it isn't that easy. There are a lot of impediments along the value chain that impede the success to happen there. And then the consumer is disappointed. Well, that's fine, I would argue. You can, we are just humans, right? We make mistakes. We just want to learn fast. But we have to learn together. There is only one chain of events. It's one chain of value that we are creating. And this is old stuff. When did Porter come up with this? Basically, his value chain concept a long time ago. And the other thing is we don't want to waste our time. We have to be lean in the way we operate. 
and remove the waste. We remove the impediments along the value chain. And where those impediments are related towards a lack of agility, the bed sizes are too great, too large, and I can't basically quickly change things around. Or the lack of the fact that I can't onboard third-party components. I can't multi-source, I can't do, do multi-vendor management. Or what I have to do with the lacking automation, I'm still doing all these things manually. Why? Because the systems don't talk to each other. Even the systems that just power this value chain, they just don't talk to each other. Or because uh, basically I'm messing up about security. All kinds of impediments that cause me, in the end, to have a disappointed consumer. And the consumer can be machine, system, or human. So I want to fix that. But let's sort of build on this and said, OK, so we, we said that we are building a system of system. And to create services for that system of system, I basically am trying to satisfy the consumer. But the typical system of system has devices, mobile applications, web applications, ERP backends, analytics, mainframes, applications living on platforms, etc. And this is not an atypical picture. If you think about the f your cell phone application, you know that there's very little logic sitting on your cell phone. It works because it's wired up via wireless network to other applications, to backends, to make sure it works. You've got a system of engagement in your hand. You've got a system of transaction, basically, in the back office. You've got a system of insight processing your data, trying to give you that right piece of information so you can make more smoother decisions. And maybe it's also that my car is driving around and just gives an, an IoT device collecting information for that. So I got myself a composition, an aggregation of different service components that jointly will make up the customer experience. And that's only one part in that system of system. And there are many. But each of those components have a life cycle. And I'm trying to make a composition of a service components into only one service offering into that system of system. But I got expertise needed here for how do I deal with devices with their own APIs and a known vendor. And they, they're closed and I can't access that. It's just a given. There is a life cycle, but I can't access it. It's just a thing that they produce. Or I'm using mobile devices. I'm creating mobile applications. Or I've got ERP applications, but those guys don't get it. They're basically living in a waterfall world. So I got proper agile using containers technology. I got ERP systems in client servers. I got logic sitting on mainframes. I got IoT devices using embedded technology. I got people that are going fully agile. I got people that only have agile in name only. I got people that are 100% waterfall. So I got hybrid in every dimension. I can own it. I can't own it. Different technologies, different maturities of how you do the application development. And still, we would like to have this wonderful connected world of systems of systems all working together. Hmm. No wonder that we still have a long way to go. Boy, what an opportunity we have. Especially, again, if you're technology. And that I said, it's not that we don't know this, it's where to invest. Where do you see yourselves in this equation? As a service provider, as a vendor, as a customer, as a provider of services to someone else, where do you fit into this equation? And where do you invest? Do you invest in cloud, brokering, DevOps, security, maintaining your core, exposing APIs, publicizing them? Are you thinking inside out because you love your technology, you would like to talk about your APIs? Or do you think outside in because you love about the outcomes and make sure you want to drive a business? Are you still dem are you demand driven and pool driven, pool orientated because you can quickly respond to customer needs or are you basically push driven because you have optimized your production capacity to produce a lot of volume of a particular kind? And there's no bad, it's just saying that it's, it's, it's a wonderful hybrid world. But when I meet and go out there in my own role, I feel this is one of the biggest challenges the customers are facing, the people I speak with are facing. How do I, how do I manage this? Where do I invest next? I would love to be this nimble digital IT value chain. I got money to spend. I don't know where to start. I spent millions in the past five years to optimize my internal cloud. 
or to improve my internal infrastructure team. And still the business is complaining that I'm too slow. Why is that? Well, because could it be that you're trying to impose too many changes on the same group of people inside your own company? That in the end there are only so many processes in the world and therefore in your own little microcosm of the world there are only so many processes you have to do and that you're overloading the same people with more tasks to do. And then I said it before as well is that logistics basically has already calculated that when you start loading people with more than 80%, the value chain, their effort, their productivity drops tremendously. They just clock up. You can't handle that. So how do you get yourself organized is essentially the matter. And the real challenge is it all needs to be done very aggressively because we as consumers have grown very impatient. We don't like things not to work. And we can actually control with the click of our finger where we go next. And the more open the APIs become, the easier it becomes to move from left to right and find someone else who did get it right. Business models are fundamentally changing because everything is going digital. And again, I'm not telling you anything new, I'm just sort of reflecting on reality. Hmm. Makes you think. What we could do is basically pretend there's nothing to do and just don't solve the problem. It will go away. Well, I think we all know that that's not going to happen. So let's find another way, Ooh, that's a glitch, um, to look at this particular problem. And we call this the value chain lens. And if you bear with me, it's a little bit hard to read. But at the heart is that consumer, human, system, machine, asking for the right kind of service to get. It needs to be cheaper, better, faster, or safer. At any given point in time, it's either one of those. If you can't say what's the, next, the highest priority, then you're not zoomed in enough because we can't handle complexity. We need to focus, sort of divide and conquer. So for any point in time, for any particular service offering, tell me whether it needs to be faster, better, cheaper, or safer. And then we can handle the problem. Once I know that, I'm going to find, okay, so what is it that I need to fix? Is it about the quality of information? Is it about that people have not understood what they should be doing? Is it about the processes that are not streamlined or, let's face it, not digitized enough? Are they not automated enough? Or is it the technology that is basically failing? And when we know that, we can actually figure out, uh, let's, do we need to become more agile? Lean product development, reduce the batch size, being able to do the basic the release trials, A-B testing. Or is it about being able to multi-source, being able to onboard commoditized components from third parties, being able to invoke their APIs and pay for them, being able to hold them against the contract, making sure that actually they pay upon promise. And being able to see if things go wrong, to be held them accountable. It's a life cycle management challenge. You have to plan for it, you have to onboard, you have to make it available, you have to manage it. Automation, same thing. From basically task automation to process orchestration to basically machine learning. Why ask yourself the question, should I be conducting all these steps manually? Or can we actually get rid of those steps? Digitizing the processes, in other words, eliminating the process, business process re-engineering. And how about security? Where is that personal identifiable information? How vulnerable is that? How much money should we allocate to deal with that in planning? When we create it, do we have all the clear requirements available in our backlog so we can develop accordingly? And when we test it, can we actually test it? Static code analysis. Can we deploy it on a secure environment? Do we know what a secure environment looks like? Have we tested whether the environment is secure in request to fulfill? And when we actually go into operations, if there is a security breach, do we detect it? Can we pass data in an anonymized way? Can we use test data that is anonymized? Can we handle the certi certificates between different systems? Do global key management. So it's the combination of these things in every step along the value chain, the four of them in conjunction, that make it all work. Not one, not the other, all four in conjunction. So when we then apply that value chain lens to our value chain, we can turn this wonderful but a little bit disorganized chain of events where people are working very hard every day to get their job done 
but maybe in a little bit of a siloed fashion, and start basically looking through the value chain lens, and start use case by use case, wherever the chain is weakest, to figure out where we're going to fix it. And whether we need to make it more agile or more secure, or whether we need to make it more automated or more multi-sourced, every fix I do, use case by use case, I will turn a siloed, disjoint, not integrated chain of events in a wonderful digital value chain. Where everybody is also streamlined to do one thing, is focusing on the customer outcome. And again, the customer can be a person, a system, or a machine. If you don't get this right, you're going out of business. Jeff Bezos recently said again in an article that it's always day one, implying relentless customer focus, customer for life. So figure out how you can organize and operate your IT value chain, your IT operations, your business operations, with this in mind. Wouldn't it be great if there would be an industry standard that helps us to identify what that value chain looks like? And that is exactly where it for it comes in. it for it was once created to actually solve the problem that between plan and build and run at that stage, and later on deliver in the middle, systems were not integrated. The people that were in the planning department, in the portfolio management CTO office, they're making decisions without having a full insight in what's what's happening in operations. As humans, but also it was very hard to massage the data. And then they charted initiatives and they lost track. Multiple development teams across the different places, using each different tools. It's very hard to keep the insight and data connected. And then basically you know, in, in request fulfillment, whenever things got deployed, everybody was managing the vendors the different teams in an isolated fashion. And then operations was basically sweeping up the floor. They were doing whatever they could, fire drill after fire drill, to make sure that they still basically got everything in operations because lights need to, keep get, uh, need to be kept on. There was no industry standard that defined the information model to run a business of IT. And that void is what IT for IT fixed, or I would rather say is fixing work in progress. It's based on two key premises. The value chain idea, and I guess by this stage in this presentation you understand why value chain is so critical to the whole thinking. And the other part of portion is basically lean manufacturing concepts. Eliminating the waste from the value chain. It's very complementary to other frameworks out there like COBIT or ITIL. It's not competing, it's complementary. It focuses on the information model of IT whereas the other frameworks focus more on the tasks and activities or the governance. So the three become one. But the focus here is really to manage the life cycle with a consumer-centric service model. And again, but the most important thing is that you to that we transfer from a plan, build, run operating model, which is heavily project-orientated, very expertise center oriented towards a service orientation or an asset orientation if you like. It started way back in 2011. I would argue it started before then, but in 2011 it became a forum, and later a consortium, and later it became a forum. And today, as you can see, it is actually quite popular. One of the reasons, I guess, that you're all here. More to come. And the really uh, interesting ideas, and that's I would like to say is the key takeaway, is that if you want to do IoT properly, you want to do it with IT for IT. Because the pinnacle point, that whole thing about request fulfillment, I will zoom into that one shortly, is where it comes together. This is a little bit like an eye chart. If you ask any IT for IT person, they love the blue boxes. And they can talk for hours about them. And every line, and every entity, back to forth, forth to back, top to bottom, bottom to top, they love it. For a good reason. This shows basically the essential components that are required to take a wonderful idea, a concept, all the way down to the other end to an actual service that's being monitored and managed inside an operations department. This is where it all fits. 
This is the unique idea about it. All the other black ones are nothing are not are there to actually get this to work, the service model backbone or the asset model backbone. This service life cycle is where it all revolves around. And all these lines and all the other lines decide exactly what is the information I need to process a great idea into a chartered initiative, into a service release, into something I put in a catalog, to what something I can manage in operations forever until I decide to take it out of my portfolio and replace it with something else. But when you think about Internet of Things and humans, systems, and machines asking for stuff, you could argue I don't really care about the blue boxes. The only thing I care about is that there is a catalog accessible to humans and machines to consume from easily with as much as we can get it, open standards, so we know what we're talking about and we can switch vendors. Just like we as humans are able to switch from cell phone application to cell phone application. We all know we have a long way to go to make this happen, right? When they have real seamless transition from one to another. But that's, especially in the open group, the challenge we're up against. And open for, I would argue. So the whole value chain comes at the pinnacle point that things to be consumed from the catalog. And not just because it's available technically, because, but because I'm actually making sure that that part is driving my business. If we go one step further, it's like, okay, what, does a, what, what powers a value chain? Why is this so interesting? What do you need to do this? And we mentioned a couple of things already. The whole thing on GDPR, security, knowing what information sits where, all the regulations around, making sure that the right information is available, the latency of information, the life cycle of the information, in information management, the ability to crunch big data, to basically take data from cameras, to process it on the edge, to transfer it over the network towards the central data center, to be able to retrieve information very quickly, in near real time if possible, so that basically the trains can be stopped before I cross it without paying attention. In application delivery management, it's all about getting more agile. Uh, we've seen talks about the linkage between IT for IT and DevOps. Absolutely so. If you don't get you know, a team to work together in a DevOps style, then how quickly can you get new releases into your catalog? Well, if you're not quicker than your competitor, then you're going out of business. So the ability to actually have systems support you across your application lifecycle management is crucial. Examples basically where you start mixing sort of big data and application delivery management is where the application management tools know the risk, the risk you have in your applications, where it sits in your code trunk, and how important it is to your key service offering, so that it starts basically applying the right quality of test resources to it, so you can test more rigorously. But another thing is also interesting to think about. If you're basically building yourself a system of systems, do you want to buy yourself all the assets that are required to do so? Think about basically setting yourself up a whole live lab of cameras and sensors, um, software, networks, etc., to basically to validate whether your application, your composition of five, eight, ten components works together. Or would you rather be able to actually to do virtualization of networks, virtualization of services or APIs, virtualization of data, so that you don't have to acquire all these assets by yourself? In IT operations management, the ability to actually to control things that are available, to make sure they're always available, that you're able to fulfill the request that comes in, even though the devices you need for that are not always yours. The ability to do trend analysis, again using big data, and then the security arm of it. So there are many different qualities that you need, all in conjunction, not as a side project, but as part of the heart of the value chain, that need to be fixed. The good thing is you don't have to fix it all at once, but if you want to get yourself a sort of a checklist of all the things you need to do, to make sure that you got yourself a digital value chain. These are part of your checkbox. And this is also where the world of IT for IT, or IT management and operational technology meet each other. Because if you think, if you look through a lens of IT, and you look at basically a wind park, as an example, a wind turbine is basically a data center sitting on a, on a pole. If you mix it up with SCADA systems, um, it's just, it's similar, it's analogous to what a hard disk running out of hard drive space, or a CPU cooling out, or a power supply cooling out, etc. 
So there is a way to actually connect the world of SCADA and the world of uh, operational technology towards the world of IT, and then start basically applying some of the best practices. If something goes wrong, you got an event. A wind turbine is nothing more than a big configuration. It happens to be physical hardware. It's another asset, just like you have it in the data center or not. If an event is happening and you have the configuration information, you can correlate it, you got an incident. If you got an incident, you can turn it into a problem. If you can turn a problem, you can turn it into a defect. The defect you can fix before it breaks down. There are very stringent regulations in basically going out there and fix a wind turbine. You can, by average, only do it once a year. And you have to do basically all kinds of health and safety issues have to be met. So you want to fix the turbine at the point in time that there is actually a low wind. And for the machine, the turbine that actually is most, uh, most needed for repair. So this is really is in the moment rep uh, repair instead of basically, and it's preventative maintenance, but actually half the timing needs to be right. So this is big data and traditional IT management and operational technology and security for that matter, all coming together into one solution. The same thing happens on the other side. There was a race going on that really tried basically to cross, I'm not sure how many countries, 19,000 kilometers in nine, around about nine days, three drivers. And the trick was basically to basically show how do we get the car from A to B with real-time monitoring, real-time processing of information, even the drivers barely wearing uh, body vests to, uh, to monitor how well they were doing. And they could see from the data captured whether they were fatigued or not and whether it was time to switch out the driver. Again, just a time trial where a lot of technologies have to come together to make that happen. It's not just software, it's not just information management, it's not just security, it's not just network technology, it's not just big data crunching, it's all of these things together. And why do I say that? Because an IT value chain and a business value chain, they're basically two parts of the same coin. You can't separate them, especially not when you try to basically drive a big city. So far, so good. Happy kids, happy robots. So let me get to the summary. <coughs> I would argue that a smart city is basically a bunch of software augmented devices hanging together. The unfortunate part, or maybe the fortunate part, is that it's not one single vendor that controls them all. So it's all about interoperability. It's about latency, and we, as humans, are driving and really pushing that frontier forwards. We want to have the best apps on our phone, but I also want to make sure that there is real-time information being processed so the train stops in time. We want to make sure that that's secure and that it is cost-effective because as a citizen, I don't like my city tax to go up or I will move. So it's an interesting conundrum for us to jointly solve. When we talk about IT and IT management, multi-mode hybrid IT is a fact whether the IT is part of a device or not, or an asset, replace it with the word you prefer. But the fact that we have multiple technologies built by multiple parties, whether we build it ourselves or we source it from someone else, whether it's basically a device, whether it's a mobile application, whether it's built on container-based technology, client-server, mainframe, connected through wireless networks, through wi wide area networks, through local area networks, etc. We just have to figure out how it all works together. And that basically is the pinnacle of what we're trying to solve. There are enough creative ideas to do so, but that's really the chance we're in. And that's why the Open Group is such a powerful body to help us think through that and see how the worlds connect. Would you like to go home and leave your cell phone behind for a week? <coughs> just as a crazy idea. They did an experiment. Two things happened. People at first actually felt really sort of dis disconnected, essentially. Um, it was harder to be productive. It was better to be social. People started talking to each other again for a difference. They slept better, as an example. Um, so I think there again, you know, we, we want to be digitally enhanced, but we also have to live with the fact that we are really dealing with the technology. Are you getting used to the idea that when a next appointment appears in your calendar, your autonomous car, or rather the autonomous car of the neighborhood, pulls up in front of your house. It brings you to your appointment. When you step out of the car, the car goes off again and maybe delivers a package for one of the big vendors. That's the world we're going into. You don't own the car anymore. You don't want to own the car anymore, do you? So it's more than just changing technologies, changing regulations, changing financial models from owning to what's subscribing. It's happening. It will change a 
uh, require a big shift in our own min minds, at least ability for mine. If you're running an organization that is providing services, um, your business models are changing. And you better find a way in which your value chain becomes digitally enhanced, becomes a digital value chain, where you're integrating things like, like I said, I mentioned it already so many times, I dare not to repeat it. So, but the, the request to fulfill part of the value chain is the crucial element. Because there is where you make your business or break your business. That's where the service offering is being provided. And that could be just as well an API with a cost model behind it, or free of charge. You can decide to give it away with control over who is using your API because it could contain your data. And then basically different technologies that you require to power your value chain because you are so disconnected, because you can't afford to basically be invested in all those networks and devices and teams. The ability to virtualize it, to have big data augmentation, to pretend there is network virtualization, you can test on different networks, whether it's the latency is low enough, et cetera, are crucial facts to survive in this world as a company. We started by saying, okay, what is the linkage between smart cities and IT for IT? Well, I think there's a big soda company that is at just at zero, and that's what I did. I think going forward, let's think about IT for IT as part of IT, IOT, as much as anything else, because without this software enhancement, it won't work. Thank you. <laughs>